Hey, once again, everyone loves to hate Tesla. Tell me something new. Now let's hop straight into this video. Shout out to my big homie, Steve, solving the money problem. He's the great channel, guys. Go, let me give a like on this video. Hey, go check him out. Solving the money problem, the nine golden rules for Tesla investors. Now, recently I told you guys that I was reading a book called Just Keep Buying, right? And I told you that this book has been pretty interesting. And he's going to talk about what someone else is talking about on Twitter about a dollar cost averaging. And this is very important. And when we consider investing in the market, we always hear people talk about time in the market, when to come in and when to go out. That's mostly what Wall Street actually talks about or the financial markets and the media. They talk about going in and out, in and out, and in and out, and when to go in and out, and et cetera. We don't focus on that, right? We want something like dollar cost averaging to be the thing that we focus on. And it's just basically, guys, just keep buying. And I'm not actually saying this is for Tesla, but this is for anything that you do in the market. It's one of the things that I do, right? You could do whatever you want. You can go out here and time the market if you want to. That's that's your prerogative, okay? But in this book, once again, just keep buying. They talk about the same thing, right? And so let's hop into this video and see what they have to say. For a great thread. Shout out to Steve Fair Use once again, solving the money problem. Go subscribe, give a like. He's a great YouTube channel. If you're sensitive, beware. Visualizing some lessons about investing over on X. Lesson number one is that dollar cost averaging makes market timing irrelevant. This chart may as well be my buying activity on Tesla stock since early 2016. For more than the past eight years, with essentially every spare cent, when I have money, I buy Tesla stock. I haven't attempted to time the market because I understand this and I acknowledge that over time, there'll be periods where I buy Tesla stock and then days, weeks, months, quarters, even years later, I could be buying it for a lot less than I paid for it recently, but I'm also buying then. This has resulted in an average price on Tesla stock since I began buying in early 2016 of less than 110 US dollars per share. The stock currently over 170. I've paid as much as 393 US dollars for Tesla stock in November 2021 and as little as $12.36 in May 2019. I openly acknowledge that my brain is nowhere near big enough and my ability to see into the future. The best morning routine for manifesting. Which is pretty funny. That's what people do when they don't time the market. They just respect the market and respect that they can't make that evaluation. They respect that they can't figure it out and where it's going to be at this time. We're not like those guys giving out here price tags and thinking that I'm going to know what it is at this exact date. What we're just going to do is keep buying in. And if he's buying in and he's put a lot of money, I think this guy, he definitely has to own over 10,000 shares. And that's me lowballing big time. So 10,000 shares and its average is 110. If his average is 110 and it's up to 170 now, that's 60 a share. If that's 60 a share, that's going to be at least 600,000 that he made in profit. But that's a lowballer. But I think he owns way more than that. Like way more. I, guys, that guy owns way more. Maybe, uh, maybe 50,000? 50, 50,000 shares? And that's still lowballing them. But if it's 50,000, no, it's got to be more because I remember seeing his portfolio once. So even if he bought 50,000 shares, uh, that'd be, excuse me, $3 million difference from that. And, and, and that's just lowballing on his shares, right? So he has been doing great for himself as far as geniuses go. But he respects the market. It's too complicated. That I don't even try to time the market. I just look over a long time horizon, a decade plus into the future, and think, hmm, a decade from now, will I be glad that I was buying at these prices today? If the answer is yes, I keep buying, which is exactly what I've been doing now for more than eight years running. Lesson number two, cash is short-term safe, but long-term risky. These are absolute facts. Another reason why instead of having an absolute mountain of cash, trying to time the market and waiting for dips, I just buy when I have cash. Now, don't get me wrong. You do have to be able to account for emergencies, e.g. through consistent income, or some form of a safety net or the willingness to sell assets you'd prefer to hold on to in case of emergency. 
But it is my belief that, generally speaking, cash is trash. Why? Inflation. If you have a pile of cash and do literally nothing, its buying power will erode over time due simply to inflation. On the flip side, over time, stocks, generally speaking, on average, tend to trend higher. Now, obviously, we're not just talking about individual stocks, but the general trend is up, whereas cash gets eroded due to inflation. Another reason why I'd prefer to be... And that makes sense, guys. Instead of holding and hoarding cash, besides for emergencies, it doesn't make much sense. It erodes over time due to inflation and due to other reasons also, right? The devaluation of the currency places like Turkey, places like Argentina. You would have been better off putting your money into S&P, ETF, uh, indexing. Index that S&P, 8% on a million versus holding a million in cash. And over time, especially if you were unlucky to have a million, let's say in Turkish lira equivalent to a million 10 years ago, then that figure would be considerably less because of money, extreme it devalued. And so net net, it's always best to shell your money away into an asset. Now that could be other things like real estate and et cetera, but net net at the end of the day, holding cash is not great. Only hold cash for emergency. Better to be in the market than sitting on the sidelines. Another great lesson, expect the market to play all kinds of mind tricks on your emotions. Luckily for me, I'm an autistic robot, so it does not apply. Jokes aside though, example on screen now, you buy a stock for $10, it's now $20, you're on top of the world. You buy a stock for 10, it surges to 30, and then it comes back to 20, you want to jump off a bridge, at least apparently. The way that I completely bypass this roller coaster is by not giving a flying fuck what the stock is currently worth, according to the stonk market, but instead looking into the future, keeping my eyes on the prize and thinking, hmm, what do I think the intrinsic value of this company will be that I happen to own at X date in the future, far from now? Is it more than current? Great. I'm happy. Another important lesson. Great, great lessons that are being given right here on Twitter. You know, LinkedIn and then this guy specifically right now is giving great information and gems. Yeah. What the market is. That's why I show you guys, right? I can think, guys. 14 years is not much. I can use my brain now. So I can read. <laughs> so when I look at the chart and I look at the lifetime and Tesla stock being around $10, and it's at 170 now. That shows me that not just with Tesla, but with the market as a whole, let's just say some indexes, let's not go for individual stocks, but it applies to this stock. Why am I worried about what happens now? Guys, I took a major hit in my portfolio. I'm talking a lot of dough. Like the last year, I've been down a lot. But I don't see it like that, and I don't even care. Also, I'm kind of like, Tesla's the best company we got and the best shot. At the end of the day, we damn near going to be third. No, we'll be second. We'll be second in the world if Tesla doesn't continue to do great because China's definitely going to eat our lunch money. So net-net, this is the best option that we got. But also looking at the fundamentals of the business, that's it. The stonk market. Shout out to Steve. <laughs> it's not an indicator of what it's doing on a month, month to month, year to year, year to day. I, I don't mind temporary BS. In a year in comparison to 14 years is nothing. A year in comparison to the five years, two years in comparison to five years, we still have the higher ground. Because why? They trend up. That's it. Get your emotions in check. And it wasn't easy for me, guys. I'm telling you, I didn't start off with individual stocks. I started with managed portfolios and I opened and closed at least four managed portfolios because I had to get over that feeling of anxiety when one second you're up and winning, next minute something happens and you're down. And I think a big turning point came during the COVID. Because at that point, the portfolio in which I had was down a good amount of money. But then I had some cash on the side, I think like 20, 30,000, 40,000, and I dumped it into the market even during the pandemic when everything was being shut down. I remember making that call and making that payment when I was at the bureau. I was sitting there like, man, this is going to be a good, well, at least I got a job. 
Hey man, this is where this is where you show up or get off the get off the court. So I showed up, doubled the money, and since then I never had that or broke that habit. When I go forward, if I'm looking at the under uh, the fundamentals and they're straight, it's all I'm concerned about. Every day, who buying Twitter and what's this? It's irrelevant. Even when Tesla went down to 100 and something, I purchased stocks. And I purchased stocks when it was back in 300. So net net, I just keep going. Listen, watch the business, not the stock. I've said in the past, especially as it relates to Tesla, I think it's extremely uncommon, rare, super infrequent that Tesla stock accurately reflects the value of the company. In fact, I can only recall just a couple of times ever since I first published my Tesla fair valuation, where Tesla stock actually exceeded what I believe to be a fair valuation, and not for long. At that time, of course, a lot of people, hey, man, you're going to increase your price target? Look, it's, it's gone past you. Bro, no, that's not how it works. My fair valuation is based on my assumptions, not what the stock's currently worth. Most of the time, however, the opposite has been true. Tesla stock, relative to what I think it's worth over the long term, deal of the century, hence why I continue to buy. One way to know if you're confusing the two here, inflating the stock with the business, Let's help Palestine out right now. They need food. They need water. They need medical supplies. No other country is helping them out. Come on, man. Come on, man. We're trying to get to the bag. Come on, man. Palestine ain't never helped me out. For example, would be if Tesla stock's down a bit and suddenly you feel a compulsion to demand that Elon Musk shut the fuck up and stop having opinions because it's destroying Tesla. This may actually be the most important slide that we're going to cover. This stock is not the business and the business is not the stock. This is why I continue to urge everyone watching, and I know most of you are too lazy to do this, but you really should have built your own test evaluation model. And you should be thinking through different scenarios. What's the worst case, the best case, what's the happy medium? Now, obviously, this is as much art, if not more art than science, but you've got to take the time to go through this process because then you'll have an intrinsic idea of what you believe the company, the business is worth. And then when the stock starts swinging around like an unrestrained meat club, instead of panicking or worrying, getting euphoric, you'll be able to refer to your valuation model and think, hmm, okay, looks like a bit of a deal now. Oh, you know, probably fairly valued now, maybe not buying right now, etc. As opposed to being blown about by the winds of sentiment. Another great one here. I mean, the words say everything. I mean, Steve said everything in that last slide. He nailed it, right? I spoke about that a bit, but build your own model and figure out the price. And it's based off of the fundamentals. And I base my analysis on the fundamentals. And also when I learn new things about the business and new services and new products and where they're at, guys, I'm telling you, I, I follow the people who actually work in the AI departments at Tesla. I follow the engineers. I follow the people who are the factory workers on Twitter or any platform that they're on available to the public. And so I see them talk and what they talk about and what they post, especially on something like LinkedIn. So they usually tend to post professional things. And so when something that happens, it's, you know, it's not going to be available on media coverage for them to give me the information. I have to go seek it from those people. And the world's just too well connected and insider information from the people who work there, uh, you know, of course, releasing or talk about things that they can talk about. Uh, it gives you a competitive edge on that information. It's called information arbitrage. And so if you leverage that information and know things about a company and a stock, then net net when it actually tends to come out to the masses and to Wall Street and to institutional investors, by that time you are already bought in. And when they buy in, it's a little bit later downrange. So let's move to the next point. Five, buy damaged stock, avoid the damaged companies. Exactly buy damaged stocks so during x it was a damaged stock but the company tesla was not damaged so of course mainstream media attempted to act like tesla was damaged like the ceo is more worried about twitter so how can it work because when a king's gone he puts the pieces in place so big man things still happen we still have people who are in charge of the factory. They don't need Elon Musk there every day giving them orders. Like he's there for other things, not that. And so it's called a system if you never know. And if you guys don't know, the government works in the same way. Even if the president's not there, they have a system to continue to move forward. They don't need the president making every decision constantly. It's called delegation. 
everything. We don't even need to look at the slide. Buy damaged stocks. Avoid damaged companies. Saying, I'll be greedy when others are... Let's go now. Fearful in a bull market is easy. Being greedy when others are fearful is damn hard. And the slide here. Stock surging. People are saying, I can't wait for a pullback. As opposed to me who just kept buying. Stock collapsing. People say, it's too risky to invest now. Meanwhile, still buying with every spare cent. Anyone know any folks right now who are of the mindset it's too risky to invest? They've been selling. They've been trimming their position. They've been pairing back. They've been dumping Tesla stock. No, neither do I. Another one. Yeah, no. Nah. I know some people like that, but nah, we're not cut from the same cloth. Yeah, guys, as I told you, right, COVID, it was very fearful, but I decided to buy. And I also made a great play on Boeing, too, back then. But I, I definitely decided to keep buying. Another one. On time. The best way to double your odds of success is to double your holding period. Now, this is slightly unscientific, but the point is valid. In essence, you hold a stock for a day, you get a 50-50 chance of making or losing money. Hold it for a year, you're more likely to make money than lose. Hold it for 10 years, you're very likely to make money and extremely unlikely, but it is possible to lose money. In over 20 years, you will make money. The example here, the S&P 500, there isn't a single instance over a 20-year period in which the S&P wasn't up over a 20-year interval. Not one. Now, it's true that individual companies can perform differently to the index, but the principle still holds. The shorter the time horizon, the greater the volatility, the higher the probability that you lose money. The longer the hold period, the longer the probability that you'll make money. Time for a quick detour. I posted... Guys, it, 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 he explains it, and it's simple, and it's true. You hold it for the long term, and that's better. 20 years is not bad, guys. 20 years, especially if you're aged from the age 20 to 40. S&P 500, there you go. Golden rule, not only for Tesla, but definitely for the S&P 500. And it's never been a 20-year period where you wouldn't have been winning. So when the conversation is had about what to do and where to start, and I don't know, and I don't know, who is me, poopy pants? That's a waste man thing. The easiest thing is to just keep buying waste man. Waste man. You guys call me up for a council. I'm going to call you a waste man. Because <laughs> it's simple. It's simple, man. And excuse my accent. It's probably hella weak. Just keep buying. That's it, man. That's the thing, man, is to keep buying my brother. My Nigerian brother. Posted this on X yesterday. I like to keep track of these things just to learn about my decision making. In 2019, I sold a bunch of stocks to buy more Tesla. And before the sales of these stocks, my stock portfolio was already more than 80% Tesla stock. The intention was always to be extremely heavy in Tesla. However, I did spread a little bit of capital around some other stocks in some industries with some technologies, etc. that I thought, generally speaking, probably more likely than not would see reasonable growth. I want to see what the he said. Big one has a. So I think he's probably going to show us what he did and how he redirected and et cetera. Let's see. Fucking wine. However, the point that I'm illustrating here is just regarding hold time. Even if I'd kept these stocks with hold periods of six, seven, or eight years, only two of these would still be in the red. The rest of them, by the way, shout out to China, Alibaba and KWeb ETF, absolutely wrecked. Aside from those, we've got a few ARK ETFs up close to 60 or 70%. Activision doubled and then got acquired by Microsoft. A few more ETFs, robotic surgery company, Microsoft up 243%, Netflix 70 odd percent, Nvidia up about 2000%, Qualcomm more than doubling. This is a clear visual example showing numbers based on hold periods. Now, has zero. Let's see, guys, he's just showing you like, look, look at all these companies I held or at one point or another and long hold period. This is what it does. Regrets about this decision. This is why I continue to rail against people who think their brains are large enough to trade in and out of stocks over the short term. Of every 100 people who actually think their brain's big enough to succeed at this over the long term, probably one of them actually do have a brain big enough to be successful. Unfortunately. See, guys, look at that. Since 1991, <laughs> you could be winning. Where's my thing? I didn't even know what it was. What, Microsoft under $50 back in 2001. You guys still had, Normie still had money in 2011. Still would have got it under $50. Now it's 528. Come on, guys. And look at it. 
Look at what it done. That's not a long time, guys. 2000 to 2024 is 24 years. And look at where it went in 2001 when it was quote unquote crashing from, let's say, 1998, 1999. It went down a bit. It had a little dip. Look at that dip. So, so right around here on this dip right here, I don't know if you guys can see where I'm at around the 2001. Somebody would be like, yo, look at this dip. We heard him, bro. Sell. Stuff. This, this is why I don't invest in stocks. That's why I put my money underneath the bed. That's why I put my money in, in the laundry machine. I wash my money. <laughs> I keep my money clean. Like, <laughs> that's what somebody would have told you at that time. <clears throat> Man, see, you guys don't know what you do. Then let's say you would have bought when it went down. Then from 2001, right around here in 2000, let's say, eight, it was still around, a little bit down. They'd have been like, see, you still in them dang stonk. The Wall Street, you know them Wall Street people don't want you to win. You know them suits don't want you to win. And if you tune that out, 2016, you would have been on the rise, on the rise. Then here we go. A small 2000, look, look, in 2019 with the COVID, you would have been up. You would have been beyond $100 and started out in the 50s or started lower at 20. You would have been up more than 100. Even during the, 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 the pandemic, you went down and then you went to the sky right after the pandemic. But somebody would have been telling you, man, you better be careful with them stocks, man. You know, you know the Illuminati don't want you to win. Personally, if you have a little bit of luck over a very short time frame, you get a few wins, you think you're a genius. Next time you're telling everyone you're a genius, and eventually you get absolutely roasted. This is a classic example, Microsoft Stonk, a company I've been very well aware of since I was about five years old. Some of you weren't even born in 2000, but this was roughly the peak of the dot-com bubble. And Microsoft stock at that point peaked. Call it close to 60 US dollars per share. A decade later, the stock was still down 50% from those all-time highs. A decade after that, however, up 158%. And less than half a decade from that point, in total, if you'd held Microsoft, in fact, if you bought Microsoft at the absolute peak of the dot-com bubble and just held, call it 25 years, up over 600%. Remember when everyone thought the world was ending and then it didn't? Microsoft and many other stonks collapsing 30 plus percent Imagine you panicked and thought the world was ending. Oh, my God, I better stay home. I'm scared. Help. Oh, Daddy, please inject me harder. Please tell me what I need to do. I will comply. I'm scared. If you'd bought into that narrative and panic sold, you might have copped a 30% haircut on Microsoft. But if you just held, you're now up 30%. And Microsoft... See? And it started at 10 cent. If y'all big-headed mama took 10 cent, uh huh. Is she the t man, bro? What if your mama would have took a hundred dollars in 1986 and put it in Microsoft, <laughs> and now today that would have been five hundred thousand? <laughs> That's like thirty six years. That would have been five hundred thousand. And your mama could have said it and forget it or your daddy, your alpha daddy. If your alpha daddy had... Soft since it's IPO, up 428,000%. Google stock has also gone through its ups and downs. Over a one-year period, 2007 to 2008, stock down about 60%. And during the scamdemic, Google stock collapsed over 40% and then rebounded pretty violently and is now breaking through all-time highs. Amazon stock doesn't look that different to Google. Similar story. Now, if you know, you know, there was a time around the dot-com bubble where Amazon stock got absolutely slaughtered. I think it was down about literally 90%, more than 90%, in fact. You can see on screen now, literally more than 90% down. If you panic sold there, rest in peace your investment. If you continue to hold, up 3,700%, again, in about 25 years. Saw the same crash with Amazon stock during the scamdemic, down over 50%. Hilariously, by the way, I mean, think about this, bro. Uh, hello, Amazon, get shit delivered. If people are scared and panicking and staying at home, or being forced to stay at home due to fascist, futile, inhumane lockdowns, you might think... See, guys, and, and that's what I said, the arbitrage of information or just rationalization. If rationalization outweighs reactions, fears, emotion, 
if you guys have a true EQ, then you should invest in the stocks, in the stock market. Because if you have an EQ, you would have known during that time, right? Like, bro, if we really can't go anywhere, how are people going to be getting products and groceries, shopping? Huh. And Amazon's going to do bad? Really? The place that delivers retail items and consumer goods and products and even grocery store? I, like, they deliver it to your house. And so during the pandemic, if you would have just bought, you would have been winning. Less than $100. Now it's up. More. Double. Right? It went down 50. So basically, yeah, double. You would have doubled your money. All-time highs now. And you would have been up flexing. Big man team. If you would have bought when everybody else was scared. Because you're just like, this doesn't make any sense. Like I was in the market to purchase real estate during the pandemic. I was like, man, it'll be all right. The world ain't over. And if it is, then shit. Balls to the wall. <laughs> Hail Mary. And if the world's over, then if the world's over, like it don't matter if I threw it in and got intercepted, we're all about to be deleted. Like, you know, like it don't matter, man. I'd rather have $10 and get deleted in a post-apocalyptic era. Like, nah, man, not me. Bump that. <laughs> I think people go, hang on, that maybe that will benefit a company that delivers shit to people. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Idiots. Yeah, who makes these games? And sure enough, Amazon stock now pushing all-time highs once again. If you get swept up in the fear, uncertainty, the doubt, the panic, try to time the market. Oh my god, it's crashing a bit of sell now. Probably didn't age well. And the final example is Apple stock. Over the long term, solid gains, but there's been a lot of volatility along the way. Given how much Apple's grown, however, it's hard to see that. But there's been massive drawdowns on Apple stock. Better part of 40%, over 30%, crashing during the scandemic, and then reaching new all-time highs. It really is true that on average, the longer you hold, the more likely you are not to lose money. That is assuming you haven't bought a steaming pile of excrement. Next. Yeah, don't buy a bummy company. Just go S&P 500 for you normies. Developing the right mindset is 95% of investing for success. This guy's dropping burner. Burner. Call this guy burner boy. Slide. So on point. Developing the right mindset is 95% of investing success. Absolutely agree with this, by the way. One mindset. Stock surges, hooray, my net worth went up. But the real G's, stock crashes, and they think, hooray, my favorite stocks are on sale. And this is a really compelling insight in terms of whether or not you're really cut out for investing. Most people watching this channel own Tesla stock. How do you feel when the stock surges versus when the stock has collapsed? I've said it. I'm super happy. Like the guy said, man, when the stocks go down, I'm like, man, I'm finna go shopping. Put on that fabulous song, like, what's it called? I don't know, something about, but I'm Dame Dash. I'm popping tags. I'm popping tags at that point. Sticker tags. Like, I'm out here popping sticker tags. Like, uh, uh, uh. What up, boy? Mm, yeah. Oh, look at you. You hurting. Bing, bing. I'm going in there and buying a sale. I, I like, that's why I'd be like, I really don't get mad when the media be coming out with all that proper Jeezy. That's propaganda for you normies. When they come out with the propaganda and they're like, oh man, Tesla sucks and they undersold China. I'm like, yeah, Tesla sucks. Yeah. You know, much bad. And then the stock go down a little bit because people are like, I don't understand what he said at investor day and AI bad AI day and battery day. I don't, me don't understand. Where's the cool product? I'm like, yeah, me don't understand too. Then the stock go down. I'm like, Popping tags, bro. Mm -mm, popping tags. I'm going shopping. I love it. Another great slide here. Planning is useful, but the real world never matches a spreadsheet. Man, this is absolutely on point. Expectation here, a perfectly smooth curve up. And the reality, extreme volatility, yet still trending in the same direction and ultimately ending up at the same destination. This was such a great thread to go through. Some really invaluable visualizations, some key principles in terms of investing. I just wanted to close with this visualization, which looks surprisingly close to the slide we saw at the beginning of this presentation about dollar cost averaging. These dollar cost averaging, man. I love it, man. Shout out to Steve. 
guys, go check out his channel. Like, he even keeps me grounded sometimes, solving the money problem. He's a great guy. He's doing his thing. Like, shout outs to him. I don't even know where he's at. I think he's like in the Australia, just like living a good life. So, just shout outs to him, remote mortgage. Uh, he used to be a loan officer, did some other things, but definitely, guy keeps me grounded also. Great gentleman, true man, true good friend I have virtually, man. He's not a waste, man, all right? But that was a hot lesson. That guy, Chris, was dropping. He, he He's the new burner boy in town. But after he ended up talking, I was just like, guys. A fantastic day for capitalism. Facts on the city. Man, guys, if you love this installment, just like you love the hate on Tesla, everyone loves the hate on Tesla. But at the end of the day, Tesla is amazing. There's no denying it. I know you guys don't like it. You don't prefer it. But just those nine golden rules not only apply for Tesla investors, but applies for the S&P 500 in the market. Now, this is not financial advice, okay? So you normies don't come after me. But you normies, if you really want to get busy, go pick up the book. Just keep buying. If you really want to do something with yourself and your wealth and change your life and not just have a bunch of money, but just have capital to go ahead and get your freedom papers. Me's going to get my freedom. Get your freedom papers. All right. Start your brain. And get active today. Shout outs to the U.S. Shout outs to the people who love to hate Tesla. Because, of course, hooray, you hate. Stock goes down. I'm popping tags. Shout outs to Dame Dash. USA all day, and I'm proud to be 